1 million users in one year. This is what a new email client named Skiff has managed to do. Of course, this is nothing in comparison to Gmail's total user count of 1.8 billion users. But this is also what makes Skiff so impressive. In an era where Gmail is ubiquitous, Skiff has managed to grow to a million users from scratch within a matter of months. On paper, Skiff doesn't offer anything remarkable per se. They're just an encrypted email client with a solid UI. What's even more interesting is that Skiff is able to get away with the much more traditional avenue of monetization. Nowadays, all the craze is to make everything free and come up with super creative ways to monetize users, whether that be collecting data or running ads. I mean, this was literally the selling factor of Gmail, a free invite-only email with extraordinary storage capacity. But this comes with its own set of disadvantages. For one, Google is an ad company who makes money by getting to know you as well as possible. And what better way to get to know you than reading our emails? This was actually a big controversy back in the day, and Google apparently stopped reading our emails back in 2017. But certain smart features suggest the opposite, so you can take that for what you will. Skiff, on the other hand, can't read your emails even if they wanted to, because everything is end-to-end -end encrypted. As such, they have turned to a more archaic mode of monetization, where people actually pay the company directly for the service. Maybe some of you are too young to know about this, but this is how companies used to do business. And Skiff is trying to bring this model back to one of the most competitive industries in the world. While they do have a generous free tier with 10 gigabytes of storage and even custom domain support, the only way they make money is from people who spring for the essential or pro tier. Given their user count though, it doesn't seem like this is really slowing down their adoption. They even have some super notable users like Vitalik Buterin, the founder of Ethereum. But it's not all sunshines and rainbows. To get to this point, Skiff has had to raise over $14 million. Also, while Skiff does have quite a bit of momentum right now, it's not clear if they'll be able to maintain this momentum after they burn through the privacy and UI-centric folks. The reality is that while the average person would like to have more privacy, they're also too lazy to change anything they're currently doing. So join me as we take a look at whether Skiff is truly the next big thing, or if it's just a niche product that'll never be more than just that. The main appealing factors of Skiff are pretty simple. It's probably the best looking mail client on the market, and it has privacy that even experts seem to like. In fact, all of Skiff's code is open source, so if you're a coder, you can take a look at exactly what the platform tracks, how it encrypts your emails, and whether they're actually being honest. Even if you're not a coder, you can rest assured that everything truly is private, as Russia has given it the seal of approval by banning it. Skiff is also trying to address traditional shortcomings regarding mail filters and centralization, but really, the selling factors are the UI and privacy. That's pretty much it, but oftentimes that's all you need. When you're addressing something as established as email, there's really not much you can change, but that's okay. You don't need to revolutionize email, you just have to make email noticeably better. I mean, this has been Google's secret sauce the entire time, they were never first to anything they did. There were plenty of search engines before Google, plenty of emails before Gmail, and plenty of browsers before Chrome. Fun fact, Google's own CEO, Eric Schmidt, was strongly opposed to building Chrome, as he felt that entering the browser wars was futile. In fact, he single-handedly delayed the launch of Chrome by six years, but that didn't stop Chrome from being the biggest success the browser space has ever seen. The truth is that while first movers do indeed have an advantage, that's all it is, an advantage. It's not an endless monopoly over a certain domain. I mean, ChatGPT is disrupting Google as we speak, which brings us into our next point for Skiff, which is the sentiment surrounding Google. One of the biggest reasons that Google was so successful was because of their underdog nature. People love to support the scrappy startup that was Google. Their motto of don't be evil resonated with users. Why support Hotmail and Internet Explorer, products from the evil tech monopoly Microsoft, when you could support Google? But while this worked in Google's favor back in the 2000s, this is no longer the case. Today, Google is very much the evil tech monopoly that Microsoft was back in the day, meaning that Google is primed for disruption. I mean, just take a look at how quick people were to laugh at Bard. Sure, Bard made a mistake, but if Google was still a scrappy startup, I bet people would have focused on the millions of items that Bard did correctly, as opposed to the few that Bard didn't. But since Google is a giant, the sentiment is, oh, 
Google is a trillion dollar monopoly and they can't even get this right? What a joke. This shift in sentiment is subtle, but it makes all the difference. All of a sudden, a service like Skiff that actually respects your privacy is worth a shot. What's the worst that could happen? It sucks and you come back to Gmail? Clearly, not very high stakes. Speaking of high stakes, Skiff doesn't have a very high barrier for entry either. One of the advantages of entering an established market is that people are already familiar with their product. People already know why email is useful, how to send an email, what CC and BCC mean. So Skiff doesn't have to convince people on adopting email itself, they just have to convince people that Skiff is the best platform for email. And given that most people are relatively tech savvy nowadays, getting them to give it a shot isn't too hard. This is why we see so many apps blow up basically overnight. In fact, if you truly have a winning product, it's easier to go viral today than ever before. TikTok gained 100 million users within a matter of 9 months. More recently, ChatGPT was able to garner 100 million users within just 2 months. 20 years ago, such traction would have been impossible regardless of how good the product was. Nowadays, information is simply shared and absorbed so quickly that if you have momentum on your side, you can go extremely far. So trying to challenge even something as big as Gmail is very much possible, but there's of course some pretty big hurdles along the way as well. Likely the biggest elephant in the room is who cares? Nowadays, we all see articles about Facebook and Google and basically every other company invading our privacy. And while I do believe that everyone should have the right to privacy, Realistically speaking, I think the vast majority of us have just become numb to the idea. I mean, is having a truly private email really going to change anything? Are you also going to find alternatives for Instagram and YouTube and Google search and TikTok and basically everything else as well? I'm gonna guess probably not. This isn't to say that these companies are in the right for collecting data on all of us, but I guess it's simply a reality that most of us have just come to accept. So it's not clear if the privacy argument will really hit as well as you might think. Speaking of privacy, it's also not clear how much people actually care about privacy when it comes to email in general. I don't know about you, but virtually all of my email use is professional. The last time I actually emailed a friend was like 2011. So there's not anything especially personal that I send through email that I would want to protect to begin with. And I suspect it's the same case with most people. Most people just use email for work or school to contact coworkers, managers, professors, and so on. Or they use it to sign up for newsletters and create accounts, but very rarely do people use email for social communication. So again, not sure how much people will care about privacy here. Something else to note is that people don't really choose what email client they use for work or school unless it's like the Apple Mail app. They just use whatever the school or company uses. Skiff's new feature that allows people to use a custom domain for free does technically make this possible, but we'll have to see how many people actually care to take advantage of this. Also, there's no way we can discuss the future of Skiff without mentioning ProtonMail. If you're not familiar with ProtonMail, it's basically just an older Skiff. ProtonMail launched back in 2014 with the promise of better privacy and a more refined UI, and they're doing pretty good. They have over 70 million accounts, but this brings up the question, what does Skiff really offer over ProtonMail? Well, we can't really make an argument based on UI because that's subjective. And to be honest, they both have a great modern UI, so it's really just personal preference. There's also of course some minor differences in terms of pricing and features, but really the main difference seems to be the encryption standard. ProtonMail uses something called PGP encryption, which has been the standard for decades. Skiff argues that PGP is outdated and that there are far better encryption standards out there, and they could be absolutely right. But how many people would actually care or even know about this? As far as the average user is concerned, both email clients are end-to-end -end encrypted. Also, all email clients will claim that they have the best encryption. So unless you really understand these encryption standards, it doesn't really mean anything to the average person. And all of that brings us into likely Skiff's biggest shortfall, which is monetization. Every dominant email that has ever existed has come from a tech giant, whether that be AOL, Yahoo, Microsoft, or Google. And the main reason for that is that email simply works much better as a side business than a main business. You simply have to reach extraordinary skill to start making any sort of profit. ProtonMail, for example, is only possible because of the generosity of its community. And it seems that the only reason that Skiff and their generous free tiers are possible are because of insane VC money. VCs are willing to go quite far nowadays in terms of funding. 
but it's not the same as Google launching Gmail in 2004 and subsidizing the cost themselves. As far as Google is concerned, even if Gmail is a break-even effort indefinitely or even a slight loss, that's a massive win. 1.8 billion users are even more integrated into the Google ecosystem. For Skiff, on the other hand, monetization has to eventually work out and they have to fundraise in the meantime, otherwise they're toast. While launching a new email client in the 2020s may seem crazy, it's actually way more viable than you might think. The sentiment against Google paired with the insane virality potential of modern apps makes a new email client quite viable. Combine this with some extra privacy and a better UI, and Skiff may very well have a winning product on their hands, but their success is by no means guaranteed. Several companies have picked up on this trend of adding privacy and UI to replace offerings from big tech companies. Some other examples are Signal, Be Real, and ProtonMail. Some of these anti-big tech offerings end up panning out, while others end up dead in the water. Only time will tell if Skiff has enough mojo to convince the general public to make the switch. Schools are already ditching Google in general, so that may be an opportunity for Skiff. Check out this video to learn more about why schools are ditching Google, but until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.